Um, thanks a lot, uh, PG, for the introduction, and also uh, to you and to Michaela and to the Web3 privacy community for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, meetup. Um, it's, a bit, uh, it's a little bit weird to talk about surveillance at a privacy meetup, so, um, but I think that, uh, 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 yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Which one? Okay, yeah. Uh, but I think that it is pretty important because if you want to uh, advance privacy and uh, if you want to advance pre uh, freedom, we should be able to uh, adopt the uh, worldview of the people that also um, are against uh, uh, privacy and freedom. And uh, if we understand how they think, maybe we are able to defend ourselves in a, in a better way. So, just a sec. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, a quick, a quick, sum, a quick summary of the presentation. First, I will try to provide a conceptual definition of privacy and surveillance, starting from the, from a, a fairly common definition of privacy. Then I will try to uh, discuss the justification for surveillance and uh, I will try to discuss the arguments that are, that are provided in order to defend uh, surveillance. Then I will show the consequences of surveillance and in particular, of course, the consequence, uh, the, the consequence that uh, gives the title to the, uh, to the talk, which, means, uh, which is, of course, a social uh, disorder. And then I will close with uh, a reference to uh, Hoppe's argumentation ethics in order to show that uh, privacy is a uh, um, a necessary condition in order to, um, um, uh, in order to defend uh, property rights. So let's start. I cannot use this. Okay. So, uh, first of all, just a very quick uh, definition of privacy. Of course, we can give a lot, uh, th th there are uh, on the market a lot of definitions. But I will just uh, I will just provide uh, provide these ones because uh, I discussed it, uh, I discussed them uh, in a couple of papers. So we can define privacy as the ability to make oneself invisible by default to potential enemies and visible by choice to uh, trusted peers. Of course, the key words here are by default and by choice. And basically, it means that uh, when we interact with uh, with other people, we should always be in control of that interaction, and we must be able to choose whether to interact or not with other people. I will return on this point later in the presentation. A very important point to me is that privacy is also an a priori condition for the, present, uh, for the preservation of property rights. Uh, a priori is a philosophical term. It means universal and necessary. And uh, basically the idea here is that uh, it is inconceivable to uh, preserve property rights uh, without having privacy. It is literally inconceivable. And uh, which means that privacy is not just a matter of uh, uh, this or that trade-off, uh, trade it is just not uh, a utilitarian choice, uh, it is not just uh, an empirical issue, but uh, it is basically something that is needed in order to uh, preserve property rights and natural rights in general. Of course, when we uh, discuss about privacy, uh, that discussion affects uh, very different domains. For example, if, if it is different to, the, to discuss privacy about the body and the mind on the one end, or privacy about uh, external physical objects on the other end, or even more important for the cryptocurrency community, privacy of ideas and information. So we should be aware of, this, uh, of these distinctions. And of course, the, we can provide also very uh, different uh, kind of analysis about privacy. For example, uh, I as a philosopher, I like to provide conceptual definitions of privacy, so to work on the theoretical level. But of course, uh, we can discuss also about the empirical and practical implementation of, pri of privacy, as a lot of speakers already did in, the, in this conference. And we can also discuss about the strategic, uh, um, uh, uh, the strategic use of privacy that, uh, um, um, uh, and the strategies that uh, we can use in order to advance it and freedom uh, with it. So, uh, a very quick point about uh, uh, privacy in the domain of ideas and information because it is the most uh, relevant uh, domain when it comes to uh, cryptocurrencies. So, first of all, here privacy is very important because it is an a priori, it is a necessary condition for the very existence of property rights in the domain of ideas and information. Of course, we are all accustomed with, for example, cryptocurrency wallets, and uh, if private keys uh, are not private anymore, that means that uh, we lose the ownership of the 
the uh, of the coins that are into the wallet. So we cannot have property. Uh, property cannot exist without privacy in, in, in this domain. And of course, this is true also for ideas. For example, I'm talking about some ideas here. I'm sharing them with you, which means that I, I, I'm losing the uh, exclusive ownership of these ideas and, uh, and that uh, we can uh, all discuss about them. And an important issue here is that uh, in the domain of information and ideas, we can have mo uh, multiple homesteadings. So th um, take, for example, this talk. Of course, before I shared the ideas of, uh, uh, of this talk, I owned the ideas exclusively. Uh, that means that uh, I, I were the only owner of these ideas. But given that I'm sharing them with you, it means that those ideas are not my property anymore. They are entering your heads, and you can do whatever you want with these, uh, with these ideas, which means that you can change them, you can modify them, you can, uh, you can attack them, you can do whatever you like, and in this process, you gain all ownership of new ideas that didn't exist before, and, uh, uh, um, and uh, these new ideas, you own them exclusively, of course, until you share them the next time. And so, this is just to say that uh, if we analyze privacy and property in different domains, we can uh, uh, discover some interesting properties uh, that are uh, relevant uh, not only for the cryptocurrency space, but in this case also, I think, for the nature of knowledge in general. So, moving to surveillance. So, we can, as a first approach, uh, as a first approach, we can define surveillance as the logical negation of privacy. That is, is if privacy is the, um, uh, is the is invisibility by default, then we can define surveillance as the uh, imposition of visibility by default. And uh, if this is the case, this means that basically surveillance can be used in order to violate property rights and to, uh, and to uh, uh, apply violence to people. So, just to be sure, it is important to make a distinction here between uh, horizontal surveillance on the one end and vertical surveillance on, uh, on the other end. Because basically surveillance is something that we do every day. When I talk about uh, uh, horizontal surveillance, is uh, the kind of surveillance that we do every day. Like, for example, I don't know, parents try to surveil their children in order to make sure that they don't get hurt or that they are going well at school. Or, for example, uh, we, hear, uh, we heard the talk uh, before, uh, about Arturo's project that is uh, surveilling the traffic on the internet in order to uh, extract some, uh, some information from, uh, from this data. And horizontal surveillance is something that is not problematic. When surveillance becomes problematic, uh, as surveillance becomes problematic when it is tied to the monopoly on violence and to the use of violence. So when government entities and uh, cronies entities like beer corporations and so on and so forth use surveillance uh, on a mass scale and uh, they can also use violence on the people through law, through legal means and so on and so forth, well, this is where, of course, surveillance becomes very, very dangerous. And this is uh, uh, what I mean when I talk about vertical surveillance and uh, in this talk, uh, of course, I'm talking about this kind of surveillance, the, the dangerous one. So, um, it is important, uh, as I said before, to try to understand how surveillance can be, uh, can be justified. Usually, uh, the, um, the, the, the advocates for surveillance uh, use uh, some kind of utilitarian approach. They usually say that uh, surveillance is, is useful for some bigger goals, like, for example, security. Of course, here, the prototypical example is the Panopticon, uh, which, uh, which is a kind of prison that was developed by Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham in the uh, 18th century, which basically, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a kind of prison that is useful, quote-unquote, uh, in order to tackle the, uh, very, the, the, uh, the risk of crime. And basically, the Panopticon creates a two-tier society. On the one end, we have prisoners, which are under constant surveillance, that is, they are visible by default to authorities, and, uh, of course, are the second tier of society. And on the other end, we have the guards, uh, which are, of course, the, uh, who are, of course, the authorities, who basically are invisible by default. The prisoners cannot know what the guards do. And, of course, the guards can see, on the other end, everything that the prisoners do. This creates an asymmetry of visibility. Basically, only the authorities can enjoy privacy, which means, of course, that they are in a position of, pir uh, of, uh, of power. Of course, the panopticon nowadays is a digital panopticon, and I think that we can understand that this kind of asymmetry of visibility is very, um, uh, is very clear in the closed source, uh, in the closed source uh, environment. 
A very important point is that surveillance is justified uh, through the category of, of risk, and the category of risk can be leveraged, uh, uh, leveraged very easily. So first of all, uh, the category of risk is so vague, is, is so broad, that basically can include everything. Everything is a risk, and if everything is a risk, and surveillance is the cure for risk, then basically it means that uh, we can find a utilitarian justification for the, uh, for, uh, for the application of surveillance measure, uh, measures. And moreover, another important point, uh, if you, uh, 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 which I'm sure you are familiar with, is that when surveillance is evident that doesn't work, well, the advocates for, surve for, for surveillance uh, just say that, uh, well, Surveillance didn't work because, because there, uh, there, was, um, um, uh, th there was not enough surveillance. So we need more surveillance in order to prevent, to prevent risk. This means that, again, the category of risk can be leveraged in order to ask for more and more surveillance every time. And an important feature of contemporary surveillance is, of course, is that it is future-oriented. Surveillance is not only about uh, controlling past and, be and present behaviors of the people, but more importantly, with AI and uh, all the other uh, te technologies that we have nowadays, it is, uh, it is used to predict behaviors and, uh, in this way, to control future behaviors, to nudge the population towards a, a certain goal, and so on and so forth. So here we have uh, a tool that allows the uh, allows allows governments and their cronies to control the life of the people from the past, but also, even more importantly, uh, to the futures. So, surveillance is something that uh, is quite common uh, in, uh, in a history. There are, uh, basically, it is widespread uh, uh, nowadays, and uh, uh, I could provide a number of examples. Surveillance is relevant for, for, for the welfare state, for war, uh, for, uh, and so on and so forth. Ju I just focus on two, on two of them. Uh, one example is the so-called lantern laws. The lantern laws were passed in, the, in uh, New York State in the 18th century and basically mandated black people to go around after sunset with, uh, uh, with a lantern uh, when they were not accompanied by a white. So, this is a practical application of the panoptical principle, the idea that through surveillance we can create a two-tier society. Of course, the black people were the second tier, and therefore they, they uh, were mandated to be visible by default to the first tier, in this case, of course, the white people. And of course, a, a, another very good example of the, of the power of surveillance in contemporary society is, of course, uh, financial surveillance, which we are accustomed with uh, in the um, ecosystem of, uh, of cryptocurrencies. Because basically, one of the main arguments for cryptocurrencies is that, uh, well, they are not based on the fiat system, and we all know that fiat money always go to zero. And uh, this is true, historically speaking, but it is also true that, uh, from an historical perspective, the current financial fiat system uh, lasted for more than 50 years, which is something that is, that is really unprecedented uh, uh, on this scale. And even more importantly, the uh, current financial fiat system is a, a global uh, uh, is a global financial system. So the question becomes: Well, if the fiat system is so bad, and if fiat, it, if fiat money doesn't uh, always goes to zero, why didn't this happen so far? And one of the reason, I guess, is that. Uh, um, the contemporary financial system is also a surveillance system that makes it way more difficult for the people to exit it. And uh, of course, we know that we, if we want to use a centralized exchange, we have to KYC ourselves. Uh, if we want to withdraw, I don't know, a large sum of money, we cannot do that unless we explain why we are doing this. This is making it more difficult for the people to exit the financial fiat system, and this is probably one of the reasons why it is lasting so long. So, given that surveillance is so widespread, then we should uh, analyze the consequences, of course, of surveillance. And, of course, the main one is chaos, is complete disorder. For example, in the field of economics, uh, we know that, basically, uh, taxation is uh, meaningless if uh, the taxman cannot track the properties of the people and the economic activities of the people. So, more surveillance means that uh, governments uh, and their cronies, basically, can track more economic activity. And if they can track more economic activity, activity, uh, they can regulate it, tax it, extract more value from it. So this is, of course, disruptive for society because uh, it, uh, 
uh, it uh, halts uh, the widespread of the market of free interaction between, uh, between people and forces people to interact uh, in the way that regulators want. And of course, another important issue uh, uh, regards also the, um, the human aspect, the, uh, uh, the, the human, the social and the ethical, uh, and the ethical aspects. Of course, surveillance means that basically governments and their cronies treat us, uh, treat the population like cattle or like sheep. And if this happens, it means that uh, they will get uh, behaviors that are cattle behavior, sheep behavior. Of course, if you treat human beings in a certain way, the response will be almost automatic. And in this case, uh, um, if people are not let free, and if people are considered something dangerous, something risky, then of course that uh, we, uh, you create mistrust, you uh, dehumanize human beings, uh, you don't think that human beings are able to act uh, to decide from, uh, 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 for themselves, but you think that basically uh, every action must be controlled by a central authority and of course uh, in the end uh, in the end uh, as uh, a lot of Western economists uh, and uh, philosophers like uh, for example Mises uh, Rothbard and so on and so forth uh, showed pretty well that planned societies always 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 lead to social uh, to, to a social disorder exactly because they uh, interfere with free human action so Given that this is the picture of uh, uh, contemporary society, I, I, I want to, um, uh, to show why, uh, why privacy is so important uh, uh, even in this context. And in this case, uh, and, uh, and uh, for doing this, I want to bring up an argument by uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, which is a uh, which is an Austrian, uh, which is an Austrian uh, a philosopher uh, from the Austrian uh, from the Austrian school and from the libertarian school, who basically is the founder of so-called argumentation ethics. The idea of argumentation ethics is that basically. Um, uh, the very fact that we argue with each other, that we talk to each other, uh, provides an a priori justification for the existence of property rights. And uh, this, this is because, of course, talking to each other means that we control our own body. And uh, I just want to read the, the, this, quick, uh, this quick passage because, of course, his words are way better than mine. So he, said that, he says that argumentation is a form of action of human action and requires that a person have exclusive control over the scarce resource of his body. Such a property right in one's own body must be said to be justified a priori, that means in a universal and necessary way, for anyone who will try to justify any norm whatsoever would already have to presuppose the exclusive right to control over his body as a valid norm simply in order to say, I propose such and such. Further, any person who, try, who tried to dispute the property right in his body will become caught in a practical contradiction, since arguing in this way would already imply acceptance of the very norm which he was disrupting, uh, disputing. He would not even open his mouth if he were right. So basically here we have a justification, a philosophical justification for the existence and for the universal status of property rights. And of course, I completely agree with the position of Hoppe, but I want, to add, uh, I want to add a little twist. Because of course, argumentation is an action, but so is the refusal to argue. And uh, the ability to refuse to argue with someone is as, much, uh, uh, as important as the act of, uh, uh, of uh, arguing with other people. And if we refuse to, uh, to talk to other people, it may be basically for two reasons. First, maybe because uh, the, people, uh, refu the, the, the person refusing to, uh, to, uh, to talk to other people wants to use violence against them, which is of course a problem, and in that case we should defend uh, ourselves against that person. Or in the other case, because just a person wants to be left alone, which is of course completely uh, legitimate. Of course, if we want to force someone else to talk with us, then we will need to apply violence against them. And uh, this means that forcing A to talk will be a violation of A's property rights over our body. So this is, a, this is a very important point that has a big consequence. And the consequence is that we can complete, if we want, Hoppe's argumentation ethics by saying that not only property rights are a precondition for free argumentation, but also privacy is a precondition for free argumentation. Because argumentation can be free if and only if we are in a position to engage with others if we want, if we choose to do so, but also to refuse to talk with others if we choose so. Of course, in a non-violent matter, of course. And uh, 
this is confirmed also uh, ex negativo, uh, we may say, by the behaviors of, of government. Because governments basically are trying to make, uh, to, uh, to, to make surveillance, of course, by default, mandatory by law, and uh, are, trying to make, uh, are, are trying to make the refusal to talk to institution basically a crime. And we see that everywhere. For example, I don't know, if uh, you are a parent in Italy, for example, and uh, you don't want to disclose to the, gov to, to the government how you want to raise your children, then your children may be, uh, may, may be taken from you, for example. Or in, in the financial world, if you don't want to explain what you are doing with your money, and if you don't want to talk basically to uh, financial institutions, then you are treated like a dangerous criminal, and so on and so forth. We, uh, we can provide a lot of uh, a lot of examples. So we need to understand that uh, privacy is one of the uh, is, is one of the tools, actually, and a priority tool, a universal tool, a necessary tool that we can uh, that we can use in order to build a free society. So, the conclusion of this talk is uh, fairly obvious, of course. Uh, it is just that, uh, well, of course, we are all here because uh, we want to uh, defend privacy and to, and to advance freedom. But, of course, in order to do that, we, know, we, we must also try to understand how our enemies uh, think. And uh, this is a quote, of, co of course, of, uh, by Sun Tzu uh, from The Art of War, who says exactly this, uh, who, uh, who underlines exactly this point. Basically, we have to know our enemy in order to uh, be able to uh, advance our uh, object uh, objectives. So, thank you for listening to me. Thanks. <laughs> of course, if there are any questions, I, I am happy to. I will give back to you. Um, so, if we know our enemy, if we know our enemy, we can develop a tactics to confront and to deal with it and stuff like that. How do you think? Why many um, people in the privacy community are so easily baited by surveillance emotionally, so easily can be triggered by just the fact that an NSA, whatever, surveil, and they keep triggering the whole community in this negative loop of bad actors, bad actors, bad actors, instead of proposing anything new and i have this i even developed a meme i wish every time a person complains within the privacy community better contribute or make a pull request on a github then it would make it so much better so returning why they cannot develop a resilience techniques uh, that are uh, related with social media and emotions okay um, that's actually a great question. Of course, I don't have an answer to this question. But uh, I would say that first, well, um, when we talk about the bad actors and risk and so on and so forth, it is a very, very powerful category because basically these categories mean nothing. They are so broad, and, uh, but also so emotionally powerful that uh, just using that label makes you feel, uh, feel uncomfortable. And this of course, a, a huge factor. Of course, we are privacy activists. We uh, we want a better world, and we don't want to be associated with bad actors. And so, uh, just the use of these labels, uh, of this kind of labels, touches upon our emotions. And uh, um, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm a philosopher. I like to think that rationality matters, but uh, emotions are way, way, way stronger, uh, stronger than rationality. On the other hand, I must say that uh, we in the privacy community often, very, very often, offer self-defeating uh, arguments uh, when, when we try to defend privacy. And we often adopt a utilitarian worldview, which is the worldview of the governments and of, uh, and of the people that uh, are pushing for surveillance. Well, uh, how many times did we hear that, for example, privacy is a risk in the privacy community, but maybe it must be balanced with other societal needs, uh, this kind of arguments, privacy has its cost, has its benefits, and so on and so forth. We as a privacy activists often um, uh, try to push this kind of arguments, but these kind of arguments will never, ever, ever, ever win. It is impossible. For the very simple reason, that we are not, as privacy activists, in the position to define what is a cost and what is a benefit, to define what is a risk and what is not a risk, and uh, to define the terms of the discussion. We are not in that position. The government, big, uh, big corporations, 
are in, in are in a position of uh, are in, in the position of power, and that we also always 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 define what is useful and what is not useful according to their needs. So basically, we should avoid as much as possible this kind of arguments, and uh, we, shall, we should try to defend privacy, not just because it is useful, but uh, as a matter of principle. As I said before, uh, I try to, um, in, another, in another paper on, on another issue, I try to show that privacy is not just an empirical condition for the, defen for, for the defense of uh, natural right, but it is an a priori condition. It is a universal and necessary requirement to defend human nature. We should be able to defend privacy on this principle level, because otherwise, if we, if we accept it to discuss on the utilitarian level, we will always, always, always lose. Always. And just a quick follow-up, uh, yep. small arrow. Uh, we're also in a situation when many, and since you're in the, active in the Monero community, you see that privacy advocates sometimes go berserk after another privacy, like, hey, my Monero is better than your Zcash, my protocol is better than yours, let's run away from Signal just because. And uh, it's strange because if you work in open source and uh, you're serious, you know it's a broad stack that requires, I don't know, 50 applications, 40, whatever, and many uh, tricks along the way, and it's not just one silver bullet to so sort of solve the thing. How also the uh, specific crypto community is trapped by this mentality of one solution will solve uh, the stuff? Yeah, I mean, again, a great question. I mean, I think that one of the, again, w one of the issues, as uh, you uh, just underlined, is that often crypto communists are, are, are subjected to a kind of tribalism. That is, I mean, they are in it, uh, of course, not for the ideas, for, the, um, uh, for privacy as a universal condition for defending natural rights, but, but basically just for the money. And of course, if I'm, if, I, if I'm in Monero and you are in Zcash just for the money, then we will fight for each, against each other because we understand the economy as a zero-sum game, as a zero-sum game, game basically. But, 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 if we understand privacy as a universal, necessary, a priori requirement to defend natural rights, then it becomes obvious that the more people uh, try to tackle privacy in a very different ways, the better it is. Because uh, what really matters is not the this or that implementation of privacy that is useful for this or that uh, use case. What really matters is the principle itself. And of course the principle, given that it is universal, can take a lot of different, uh, uh, a lot of different shapes. And I think in the case of the Monero community, of course there is some tribalism uh, as, always in the, uh, as always in the crypto ecosystem. But I think that it's pretty open in trying to state that whatever technology works, it is great, even uh, it is great, even if it is, if it is not actually implemented in Monero, if, even if there is another project uh, that implements it, because the goal is to uh, gain as much privacy as possible. And indeed, uh, as you can see from uh, uh, the recent delisting, for, uh, for, uh, for example, from Kraken and uh, uh, the one from Binance uh, earlier this year, I mean, the point is not to get uh, some cheap money the point is to advance an ideal, even if the cost is pretty high, uh, high in a short term. So I think that uh, if we really focus, if we really understand privacy as a universal notion and not just as a, a nice feature to have, then uh, all of these issues like tribalism in the different crypto uh, communities uh, just go away because it just doesn't matter anymore. I would like to leave some silence after your last sentence because it's very beautiful. So <laughs> you just said something I like very much. Thanks. Uh, uh, I have a, a more of a philosophical question. Why don't you explore more the aspect of dehumanization? I would have expected a quote of Jacques Ranciere or uh, why don't you call it disadjectivation? I'm a big fan of Michel Foucault, so I feel that in your slides, maybe a little head of Foucault would fit, no? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I, try to, uh, I try to insert the panopticon exactly for this reason. And the, the, the reason I didn't, uh, I didn't get deeper into uh, the humanization is just a matter of time. So, I mean, it is just a crypto meetup, so I focused on, financial, on the financial issue, but I completely agree. I mean, it's like a true dehumanization or, or disobjectivation because uh, basically, well, actually, I come from a more Austrian background and from a more libertarian background. 
And uh, the idea is that uh, human, beings, uh, human beings are defined by, by their ability to act and therefore to take an uh, autonomous choice uh, about uh, the scarce means that they uh, possess. So, of course, in a surveillance society, in a, in a surveillance society uh, uh, this becomes basically impossible. Because, of course, if you, are, if you are under complete surveillance, you are not free to act. And indeed, Foucault, uh, Foucault, um, Foucault uh, underlined that into the panopticon, um, the prisoners that are under constant surveillance, 24-hour surveillance, basically discipline themselves because there is a sort of chilling effect that basically makes it impossible for them to act freely because they know that they're under the gaze of, uh, of the guards and that their behavior can be interpreted in a variety of ways and that the power to, the, to determine whether the, uh, whether the behavior is good or bad is in the hands of the guards. So basically the, pa the, um, uh, the power of the panopticon is exactly that. Uh, I mean, uh, the subject, the prisoner, the second tier of society is forced, is forced to uh, control themselves and to do the job of, of the guards. So, uh, of course, this implies, of course, uh, dehumanization because, I mean, you are not free to think for yourself anymore, basically. So, I mean, I, of course, this is bad, I think. This is why the event will last two hours more and we have beers to talk about Foucault and other implications of that. <laughs> of course, of course. There is any other question for Andrea? Good. Thanks a lot, Andrea. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>